excellent. So we're going to start and um, last week we only got through one page, one sutta actually, called Disputes Among the Lay People, Disputes Among Ascetics. We thought we'd give it a punchy title so people would listen to why monastics argue. It actually says ascetics but it applies all around. So that was very interesting. And this is in the chapter on disputes. And today we're starting the next one, which is from the Majjhima Nikaya number 13, on page 132. And it's called Conflicts Due to Sensual Pleasures. And I'm going to ask Venerable Pekka to begin with this, because uh, last week we only got through the first one, which I sort of led. So today you have her, and she will read it out and discuss. So for anyone who hasn't been here before, but I think you all have, um, this is a group where we can dig into the meaning, certainly, but also into the application of these teachings in our everyday life and um, how we can really make use of these teachings to, to help ease our way. And of course, this whole book is about harmony and freedom from disputing and conflict and all those things that make us suffer. So this is quite an interesting one because we usually think conflict's about anger. Mm. But here is another angle, which you yeah. want to read. Okay, so... Conflicts due to sensual pleasure. Mm. Again, with sensual pleasures as the cause, sensual pleasures as the source, sensual pleasures as the basis, the cause being simply sensual pleasures. Kings quarrel with kings, nobles with nobles, Brahmins with Brahmins, householders with householders, mother quarrels with son, son with mother, father with son, son with father, brother quarrels with brother, brother with sister, sister with brother, friend with friend. And here in their quarrels, brawls and disputes, they attack each other with fists, clods, sticks or knives, whereby they incur death or deathly suffering. Now, this too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures, a mass of suffering here and now, the cause being simply sensual pleasures. Again, with sensual pleasures as the cause, men take swords and shields and buckle on bow and quivers and they charge into battle massed in double array with arrows and spears flying and swords flashing. And there they wound by, they are wounded by arrows and spears and their heads are cut off by swords whereby they incur death or deathly suffering. Now, this too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures, a mass of suffering here and now, the cause being simply sensual pleasures. Again, with sensual pleasures as the cause, men take swords and shields and buckle on bow and quivers and they charge slippery bastions with arrows and spears flying and swords flashing. And there they are wounded by arrows and spears and splashed with boiling liquids and crushed under heavy weights and their heads are cut off by swords, swords whereby they incur death or deadly suffering. Now this too is in is the danger in the case of sensual pleasures, a mass of suffering here and now, the cause being simply sensual pleasures. So this is a really graphic sutta. <laughs> Because this is what we see on TV every day. And we shout at this government and we shout at this, this leader and we shout at the television. <laughs> but um, 
and we shout at each other because one agrees and the other doesn't agree. And he said, no, they, they shouldn't be voting for, you should be voting for the Greens and not for the <laughs> And we argue with our families, but um, nobody ever thought that the reason behind all of this is sensual pleasures. And this is such a powerful teaching because that's the last place we look. We don't look at our own minds and where is all of where you know uh, it's sensual pleasures is the we can all we noticing where anger comes from is easy because it is so uncomfortable we don't like being upset we don't like being angry but sensual pleasures we like they are <laughs> hard to notice and this is what the buddha say says you wouldn't believe it but that's the underlying cause of all this misery so um i i've been reflecting th on this a while because i kind of um it is in the suttas over and over again sensual pleasures sensual pleasures but i'm going like what sensual pleasures i don't I, I, i'm what sensual pleasures i'm not worried about you know yeah. food or whatever it is what's essential pleasures and the the uh the uh i think that's true for all of us we don't notice we notice the great obvious things we notice the uh you know when we're really upset but the subtle underlying emotions that feeling sensations the pleasant sensations that we grasp that we don't even realize we are we are holding on to they are the ones that drive us they drive us on from to from life to life and they drive us tragically to hurt each other in well in quite brutal ways so um, i would say uh, for us to reflect you know how it is in our own day in our own lives i have been doing this notice what is it that is driving you what is it that you uh, uh, what is at the bottom of of uh, your life really what is it that's driving you and to start to notice these sensual pleasures you know this attachment to to i mean it's just such a ephemeral term what the heck is sensual pleasures you know uh, and um, make it more uh, real in your life more tangible more something that is part of your practice so i uh, i thought perhaps today we could discuss how we recognize sensual pleasures in our life uh, in our everyday uh, interactions and to the most subtle level because like i said the gross ones are obvious but the subtle sensual pleasures that we we just drive on um how one can become more aware of them and um um thereby you know uh not buy into them every time so is that a good good place to start how one recognizes sensual pleasures in one's one's daily existence the subtle ones and the gross ones the gross ones are pretty obvious but the subtle ones um yeah perhaps perhaps it's a good place to start I think it sounds good so <laughs> would someone like to comment on anything it doesn't have to be there but we can just start somewhere <laughs> and then the Yeah. Hello. Um, I was going to say that when it comes to sensual pleasures, you know, we know that it's the, you know, it's the ears, it's the eyes, it's the tongue, it's the nose, it's the touch, it's, you know, those enjoyments. And I think when we can observe how our wish for things can often be the root of our bad desires, I guess one that might be common is you can, you know, you can really like the way someone looks and they can you know they can you know you behave in ways different you fancy someone when you try to something like that sensual pleasure of the eyes or the nose or the mouth all such things the same way sometimes even 
we let sensual pleasure cause us to occur in other ways by sometimes you know the you know the common phrase that someone else's meal always looks better it's the sort of thing where even <laughs> looking at our thing because we, there's a there's a sense desire for you know the other thing it really causes us to occur essentially so you know that's just in some small examples i want to give of how uh you know um sense organs as you will can lead us to dukkha in small way right yeah that's so that's uh, exactly where the buddha asks us to look in the sense in in this from the sense organs what we see what we hear and, and smell touch and taste and think <laughs> and think um but uh, yeah we i have so quickly bought into someone looking good or someone having a bit of a face that you kind of go well, that's not you know they're upset um but it's just a visual it's just a visual image you know all you saw was just a grimace and a, a word of someone said something or the other and you go, oh that's just so right there so you know it's, it's just lovely people but all it was was just a sound you know and we pick it up and we run with it but all it was it's just something coming through the sense doors, but just to recognize it, something coming through the sense doors, just the sound, and that's all it was. So, yeah, thank you, thank you. Can I unmute Richard? We can't no. hear you, Richard. You, you you can you have to unmute just you can ah oh, there you go yeah. can you hear me just about all right so basically sensual pleasures good example dispute I've got a friend of mine who you know I've known for a long time <clears throat> you know um just supposed to come around for lunch to a friend of mine who I'd invited around to lunch. You know, and like, um, you know, uh, this friend of mine had made a lunch for us. So we had some, you know, goulash, Hungarian goulash. This mm -hmm. is sort of, you know, it's very nice. It's just for, you know, it's very um, nice to have. Um, but she was just simply too lazy to come around in the end because she just felt um, too lazy. So she was very interested in going to have the food. So it's very, you know, we had a sensuous interest of going around to have the food as a sensuous pleasure. But at the same time, she was just simply too lazy to get out of bed, you know, um, to go down to get the meal as well. So this was another form of sensuous pleasure, as it were, in a way. You know, that's a good example as well. That can be a form of dispute you know, mm. as well. As an <laughs> right, right, that's true. Laziness right. is just so pleasant. as well. Yeah, we've got tons of questions already. Yeah, so, yeah, box. we've got a lot in the box as well. We'll come to you after. Mm. So, should we go to Leon? Um. Well, yes, I, I think as Ananda was saying, sensual pleasures are from the sense organs, but I don't know if it's like really the objects of the sense organs. I think maybe it's more like when I see something or hear something or experience something to my senses that's pleasant, it's kind of pulling me in, right? That object is like pulling me forward. Um, even when you're sitting in meditation sometimes and your mind goes off into thinking about something pleasant, I feel like my body will actually like lean forward or lean mm. out of equanimity into like this mm. state but as venerable Rebecca was reading i was thinking why does this have to cause so much conflict right um maybe it's like when we get pulled by those objects then we have to buy into the pleasure we also buy into having to like protect it and uh, you know fight anyone who might take it away from us or mm -hmm. make sure we have to secure it for ourselves or mm -hmm. you know when we buy into being pulled by that object then the conflict might come up as a result of that yeah 
And actually, that's what it talks about in the next the sutta, next which we sutta. might well get onto. We might get onto. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's very true. I would like to come to the box and read a few. Okay. Out here. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So someone's asking: Is irritation caused by sensual pleasures? <laughs> so. I mean, is anything caused by the sensual pleasure itself? It's interesting because here it says the cause being simply sensual pleasures. And a lot of the time we think that it's actually attachment or longing or clinging to sensual pleasures. Here it's saying actually sensual pleasure. And it'd be curious to know what the translation is, whether it's actually sense pleasure or just the senses in general, like anything that's uh, looking for satisfaction through the senses. So I guess in a sense, yes, because obviously when you're, you know, interested in sensual pleasure and you don't get it, you've, you become irritated. So, I mean, craving and aversion are always very, very close together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is pleasure? It's just uh, very relative, isn't it? Compared to, to pain, it's very relative. So if, you know, you've been in real agony, say with sciatica, which my dad is actually crippled with today and yesterday, he can barely move, you know. If that alleviates a little bit or, you know, if he takes a painkiller, then that's already a kind of relative pleasure. But if you've never had any kind of particular irritation, like one of my friends told me, oh, I'm a bit in the wars at the moment, lots and lots of health concerns. I've got a, a pain in my foot and a blocked ear. <laughs> and I had to sort of laugh. I mean, good for her, you know, I love her to bits, but she doesn't have many diseases. <laughs> and I'm sure it's a bit irritating, but it's not the same as having kind of really chronic conditions or like MS or ME or something like this. So, <laughs> so we always get irritated whenever there's a, a lack of the pleasure that we're used to having, I think. Um, mm. But also even, even just being caught up with those things is kind of irritating because a lot of people think that it's nice to kind of crave and mm. have a lot of wanting. But if you notice it a bit more carefully, it's actually a sign of discontent. Mm. Like if you're really, really content, mm. then you don't really want anything. And actually any kind of sense impingement is an irritation. But that's at a subtler level, right, that the sense pleasure in itself is irritating. So those kind of things are more obvious when you actually, the f senses start to fade in meditation or even disappear. And then you realise that it's irritating just to have to hear or to have to... Mm -hmm. I mean, I often feel it's irritating to hear. And it's quite funny because when people are talking a lot and I've got a headache, I think, oh, this is terrible, they talk so much. But then when I'm in a good mood and, I don't know, some energy comes up, I do the same! <laughs> Completely unaware that I'm irritating everybody else. <laughs> so, you know, we were all irrita irritating for others and irritating to ourselves. It is an irritation. I mean, sound is an irritation. <laughs> anyway, I won't carry on. But, um, you know, sensual pleasure, sensuality, the senses themselves are actually relatively irritating compared to when those fade away. You want to read that one? I consider the good worldly wins like sensual mental pleasure not sure if quite correct praise fame I consider the I think they're wondering if it's one of the worldly wins ah yeah 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 well pleasure probably, and pain yeah, are two of the probably, worldly wins yeah. pleasure and pain yeah um, yeah yeah we this cause us a lot of suffering one or the other <laughs> when one is gone and the other one's there we're like oh <laughs> so it's a great source of suffering so yeah is sensual pleasure those which come into contact through the five or six senses okay so firstly very important to differentiate between the five and the six so sensual pleasures is the five and the sixth is the mind um, most of the time of course it's kind of mixed up with the senses because what we mostly experience with the mind is one of the senses right <laughs> it's actually not simultaneous as people think and we all think and we all experience um it's actually that the sense consciousness arises at one of the five sense doors and then immediately after that mind consciousness knows that it felt or that it saw or that it tasted right so they actually come kind of very very close so that there's almost no possibility of seeing the difference there the change there um but there is a possibility because of that for the five to disappear and for the mind to be free from those five for a while 
in deep meditation. So um, sensual pleasures is, yes, it's um, contact at any of the five sense doors. And most of the time, the mind which thinks about them. So that's still a kind of sensual pleasure. It's the thinking about them. It's still a kind of um, mm. a, a, a sense pleasure. Most of the time we think about the senses, right? We don't think about... I mean, it's hard to think about anything beyond it. That's why it's hard to put words on deep meditation experiences. Because our language only really revolves around the five sense world, not really so much the mind. Um, not to get attached, but just accept and let them go. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think before we can accept and let them go, we have to learn how to skillfully handle the sense input and, and actually understand that it's suffering, right? So in a sense, we need to experience the suffering inherent in those um, senses. Um, we can't just make ourselves not get attached to them but what we can do is start to enjoy we can wean ourselves off by starting to enjoy the pleasures of the mind and the pleasures of the more refined kind of sensual pleasure such as for example coming away from things like romantic relationships especially if you want to be a monastic right or at least say from casual sex or something quite coarse and starting to enjoy more like benefits of genuine relationships and then perhaps from that starting to enjoy time alone as well or time with somebody else just in meditation and then maybe mm -hmm. instead of watching movies and stuff you start to enjoy sitting under a tree so you're kind of refining your taste because you're getting more contented inside you don't need that stimulation and it's mm -hmm. actually an irritation and then um, after some time you know you you just start leaning more towards the pleasures of the mind um, that's why Ajahn Brahm very much encourages like noticing the happiness even in a single breath even if it just is a relief from having to think or it's just a moment of presence there's something pleasurable about that um, and then of course later on in meditation really noticing the peace and noticing the happiness and allowing it to grow because this is how not that we get attached to meditation but it actually helps to wean us off the other stuff um, but that's a gradual process, but it's important to find that happiness in the mind so that we can turn to that more and more. Yeah. So, Ananda, I call the desire to lean Mara calling you to bow to him. <laughs> Thank you, Ananda, that's very poetic. <laughs> He, 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 he does it very successfully, Mara does. He's got all of us vying to him. <laughs> Thank you very much. Leone, I really enjoy music and playing the guitar, but often it will then <laughs> play in my head when I feel stressed or anxious. And so I notice that on a subtle level, the music actually has an agitating effect. Oh, right. Well, there you go. That's, that's when we learn... We, we learn, that's how we learn. We notice rather than saying, I will not play the guitar mm. because it is said so by the Buddha. But we, we, we see in our mind, how is it affecting us? And if we're not ready to let it go, we're still kind of like, oh my God, at least it's a guitar and not going to a nightclub tonight. Um, then <laughs> great, play the guitar. But, um, uh, but if you start to notice, oh gosh, this is, this is really disturbing my mind, then then you go, oh, mm. well, it's much nicer to let it go. And so we go to, as Venval Chandra said, more refined, more refined delights of the mind. Yeah. yeah, when you notice it's agitating. Yeah. So you never really lose out, actually. I mean, that's exactly the same experience I had in, um, when I started to meditate in India. You know, I was so much into my rock music, right? And I sang. So I sang every, every breath that Robert Plant sang, basically. <laughs> every little um and ah and baby. I would do it <laughs> really loudly. And, uh, <laughs> and so when I went traveling, I took all my little cassette recorders with me with all my favorite songs. And after a while, actually, after my first retreat, I realized that I was less inclined to play it. One of the reasons was because they were all playing back on my mind, but not only the good stuff, the really terrible stuff, like I won't say any pop stars names, but I don't like pop music. So all these terrible, terrible junky songs were just cycling through my mind. It was horrible, like almost the whole time. 
Actually, it carried on like that for a couple of years, maybe not the whole time, but, you know, it was one of the big hindrances. So because I was, like, really, really intent on practice and was basically giving all my time for that, I didn't want to keep... I didn't want to listen to anything. I just wanted it to wear itself out. Yeah. But uh, I guess you have to sort of notice the cost sort of benefit relationship, and I think that's how we slowly kind of change. As long as it's benefiting you, or at least you think it's benefiting you more than it's actually harming you, then we tend to continue, isn't it? And once the suffering gets greater than the gain, then we tend to give things up. Same in relationships, if there's, a, say, a, a relationship that has obviously some difficulties, because every relationship does, but it also has a lot of... Um, uh, goodness to it you know there's a lot of qualities there's a lot of richness or nourishment then we stay and we work through the difficulties but once those difficulties get so much bigger than um, the actual harmony and the, the nourishment it provides then then it's time to leave sometimes not straight away mind you you have to see this over a few years uh, yeah. we just read these out quickly yeah, yeah. Richard, I noticed that in the morning if I, the name, so. oh, sorry. If that, I noticed that in the morning if I give myself to I think walking meditation, not waking meditation. It's very peaceful. Yeah, right. That's 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 fantastic. It's fantastic that you find a practice that works for you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Shall we continue? Uh, oh, there, oh okay, something, so yes, sorry, yes. Yes, yes. We have people here too. We have Matthias, Casey and Shirley. Matthias is also on the screen. Mm -hmm. So Casey would like to ask. Yeah. I have a, a quick comment and a, a question as can well. Can you hear her? Can, can, yeah, I can speak more loudly if that's helpful. Um, so my comment is, I think, uh, off of something that Venerable Chanda also was uh, saying, I think as spiritual people, we can kind of feel like, oh, those core sensual pleasures aren't as dangerous. I don't tend to fight with people over like getting this. Um, but I think we can get into danger when we're already uncomfortable. Uh, we tend to be a little more short tempered. So like if we're a little sleep deprived and someone is talking to us and keeping us awake, then we're more likely to, you know, be get get upset and get into conflict. Or if we're really cold and we want to go inside and somebody is like keeping us outside, or if we're really hungry and someone's keeping us from food. So I think this is where, um, yeah, I find for myself it can get a little more touchy when we are discontent and when we're not at peace or especially when we're not aware of that discontent when it's just kind of deep down and there's somebody who is keeping us from the sensual pleasure we need to kind of remedy we think remedy this feeling um yeah so that's my my comment and then my question um i'm curious because the part about wars you know we when i think about wars i often think about it something over almost like a conceptual idea of something like power or uh, something that feels a little more like mind contact. So I wondered what's your interpretation about how mm -hmm. that, how, how these kind of larger scale conflicts come yeah. through the, mm -hmm. the five sense pleasures, mm -hmm. because if it's expanded to six can kind of see it, but for me, it's a little harder to, to visualize. Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, um, the thing is, the next sutta explains it exactly. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> which is probably a much better explanation and something we can pick out a bit more and you can ask about more because the next one is actually showing a causal sequence mm. about how craving basically leads to all these unwholesome things happening. So I think that's really quite mm. nice. I mean, I think one major way that stood out to me when I just scanned it earlier was that we, um, because of craving, because of sensual pleasures and... Um, I think you're asking how it leads to the wars and stuff. Mm. I think a lot of it is because we start to um, attach to that and we also attach to it as mine and then that expands to attaching to people as mine and countries as mine. Mm. And when they become threatened, we go to war with whole nations because there's so much attachment with, you know, the things that we mm. kind of identify with and, and think of as ours. And it is all in the sense world, right? I mean, it's a very coarse mm. level of sense um, attachment, if you like. Um, so that comes out a little bit in this next one, um, which is a causal sequence. Did you want to say something? It was very similar to what Casey said, really, about the, 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 the mind sense. 
that I always sort of feel it all comes from the mind. Mm. So I've been sort of sitting there contemplating, mm. especially after uh, um, uh, Van Wolpecker explained it, that, um, yeah, it's the way the mind grasps what comes in and the, what the mind does. Mm. And we actually don't see the sense pleasures. We're already in the mind. We've already sort of got that papancha that's mm. come up from the, is that, is that, Right, I'm just sort of trying to... Yeah, it's it the out. papancha. We're already well into the papancha by the time we realise that yeah. uh, something's gone, something's off. But, Not everyone uh, might know papancha. But it's oh. interesting. And then I was thinking of the Buddha's advice... Papancha means here, proliferation. Uh, where he said, you know, he was talking about that, but he also says mm. in, in the cognize, but I suppose that's where you stop it. That's mm. where you stop the right is that uh, yeah at, yeah. Le at least before the papancha hasn't gone yeah. too far yes. down the road usually there's already papancha by the time we notice yes but at least before it it it, it, it over overdoes itself but that's yeah that's but, what you're cutting off that's what you're cutting off the the proliferation and the but you can't stop the cognizing the cognizing is going to there's going to be some sort of mental uh, but then you stop yeah. it. You stop it there. You stop it at all the sense doors. You, st you, you, you're. A, if you can you stop have. it at the well, that's, that's fantastic. The no, yeah. well, I mean, I'm not yeah. suggesting that, that. I don't think that's possible. Mm? I don't think it's possible to stop it at the sense door that's, because yes. the, as soon as the sense contact, there's yes. sensation, there's vedana. Yes. And at the level of vedana, then we react. Yes. So I don't know I, I, quite I, what you mean about potential, but. I mean, of course, if we punch, think yes. and dwell, and, yes, but I think it's actually punch. happening at the level of the reaction to the sensation we feel as a result of the contact. Yeah, yeah. So to me, that is where we can start to weaken yeah, 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 our yeah, yeah. reaction yeah. through being mindful of that sensation, because it's not actually about the pleasure outside, it's, it's the feeling it gives us in our body and mind yeah, yeah, that we yeah, get yeah, attached, yeah, that yeah, we get yeah, addicted yeah, yeah, to, because yeah, sense yeah. pleasures are just sense pleasures that don't... They don't become pleasures for us until there's contact through any of our senses. So yeah, yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah, at that yeah, level of yeah, um, yeah. experience mm. that we actually can see the way our mind tends to, you mm. know, roll in things. Or I mm. guess by propensity you mean like dwell or think or fancy. Well, it's, it's, I that? mean, you've got, I suppose as I see it, there's the, there's the, there's this basic sense contact mm. and then along with that comes the Vedana and the perception yeah. and then we make more of it right, and, of the and then there's yeah. the there's the yeah, my yeah. making and my making mm. and that's we what think I see on, on, on. Yeah, right. on and on and on yeah. and that's yeah. where the trouble starts mm. but the reason uh, and uh, but the reason that he's taking it right back to the five sense stores mm. is is to step to show mm. where it started right right is yeah that right yeah, yeah, and perhaps yeah, to yeah, actually yeah. ask us to avoid too many sense pleasures. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? yes, because some, yes. again, here it says the cause being simply sensual pleasures. Yes. It doesn't say attachment to sensual pleasures. It says just the sensual pleasures themselves. So it's kind it's of a warning not to get too enmeshed being, in that world. You know, not simplifying, to get too simplifying, saturated by yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks for teasing that out. Mm. So let's mm. go to the next one. So this is called Rooted in Craving, and it's from the Anguttara Nines, which gives you a clue that there are going to be nine sequences, uh, nine aspects anyway, points to remember. And remember as well with these sequences that they're not absolute. It's not like this is the only way the sequence can run, but this is a particular description of one scenario that can happen as a result of craving. Okay? Because there are many, many sequences, and I'm sure you could make some of your own as well through your own experience. So, here the Buddha says, I will teach you monastics. By the way, in the last one it was interesting because mothers didn't quarrel with their daughters or fathers with their daughters, only with their sons. But that's the problem with the gendered language because I'm sure I know that I quarrelled with my mum and dad. <laughs> so anyway, I will teach you monastics, we'll say, but it of course applies to the whole community, which also included the lay people too. Nine things rooted in craving. Listen and attend closely, I will speak. Yes, Bante, those monks or those people replied. And the Blessed One said this. And what are the nine things rooted in craving? 
number one. Independence on craving, there is seeking. Number two. Independence on seeking, there is gain. Three. Independence on gain, there is judgment. Independent on ju independence on judgment, there is desire and lust. Which seems to relate a bit to what Luke Ananda, also known as Luke, was saying about you decide that somebody's attractive or not, you make that decision, that judgment mm. bit. Independence on attachment, there is possessiveness. That beautiful woman or man is mine. Independence on possessiveness, there is miserliness. Independence on miserliness, I like this one, there is safeguarding, which I was thinking of in relation to Casey's question. Mm. With safeguarding as the foundation originates the taking up of rods and weapons Quarrels, contentions, and disputes, accusations, divisive speech, and false speech, and many are the bad, unwholesome things. These are the nine things rooted in craving. Mm. So that does seem like a description of something escalating, doesn't it? Mm. A situation escalating out of all control. Um, starting off with that craving. And I like how it says dependence on craving, there's seeking. You know, because mm. craving never satisfies, right? It never actually reaches its end point or its destination. Mm. We crave and we get addicted to craving. Mm. The Buddha actually said, like, he says something like, um, blinded by delusion, fettered by craving, but Ajahn Brahm translated that as addicted to wanting, which I think is actually quite brilliant, because it's not just really mm. coarse craving, it's all wanting. Anything that's not contentment, really, mm. that takes you into that feeling of lack and the feeling of needing something else. And usually that something else is, we think it's a, a sense pleasure because we don't know where else to look, right? So he mm. says, like, we're addicted to wanting. Mm. And because of that, even if you get the object of your desire, the seeking, first of all, of course, you're seeking after it, right? But it doesn't end. That's the absolute tragedy, mm. really. We're seeking, seeking, seeking. You know, when I was younger and I mm. used to watch all this news and stuff about these crazy people going to war and, you know, or used to read about billionaires and how miserable they were. Mm. I remember going to San Francisco and um, some of my nun friends showed me the tra part of the train track where there are loads of suicides every year and it's in the richest neighbourhood and whole place. Probably the kind of place where the parents mm. are working to make their billions and don't have any time or emotional bandwidth for their kids. And all these young teenagers are just throwing themselves on the track. I mean, I'm exaggerating. It's probably not that often, but it was one of the highest kind of suicide areas in that city. Because, you know, you just... Something inside is so lacking. I think I lost my track a little bit there, but... Oh, yeah, when I heard about all these billionaires. And I used to just think, like, if that was satisfying, why would they keep wanting more money? and more money, and more money, and still it's not making them happy. Yeah. But people are so tunnel-visioned, right, and so addicted to this kind of seeking for more that they don't yeah. even think maybe it's in a different direction completely. Yeah. You know, and we're all guilty of that. What does Richard yeah. Brown say? He says we're institutionalised in the five-sense realm. Yeah. It's like, wow. Mm -hmm. Institutionalised in the five-sense yeah. realm. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Really yeah, so we're just seeking in that realm. Yeah, so it's so difficult to get out of yeah. the sense realm because <clears throat> um, it's the prison we know. Yeah, <sighs> we don't know any different. Right, and then if you look at the next one, independence on seeking, there is gain. So you do get something, <laughs> right? Which makes it even more addictive, I guess. Mm. There's gain. Mm. You feel you've, you know. You've mm. got something now. But then yeah. independence on gain, there's judgment. I find that an interesting one. Does anyone have the Pali for it? any ideas on what that might mean? Or even if you don't know the Pali, just uh, what that could mm. mean in your experience. Independence on gain, there is judgment. Is like and dislike, it's what is worthy. Judgment. And, and this, is, this is something worthwhile 
Mm. I like it. Yeah. Could be judging yeah. others as they didn't get it. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. They don't work hard. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. got it because of my merit. Yeah. They don't work hard. They don't need social welfare or whatever. Or there's yeah. judgment just in simply yeah. whether you like it or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, what do other people feel? Can we, anybody there? Do you recognise any of this so far? I'll just read out a bit. I quit a sales job making good money, took a pay, cut, and I'm happier. Yay! Very wise. Yeah, maybe because not only... I mean, why is that, right? We have we we take less money and then we feel happier. Is it because you're not seeking for money in the same way? Ah, mm. the lack of seeking, doing less. Mm. Mm. Oh yes, you want to speak? Can we unmute, Bill? Can you unmute yourself? You did, and then you were muted again. It bounced off. I'm trying. There we go. Got it. Big fingers. It's, it's because it's the constant chase. Because you're never going to quite catch it. You never quite get there. And then when you get there, you have to work harder to retain it. So it's the chase, the constant perpetual chase. And when I let that go, just has been remarkable, much more relaxed. I don't chase, mm. I don't have to achieve. Stop mm. trying to achieve and just start existing, being, just I do my job and go home. That's it. Yeah. And made, it's made the world a difference for my family and, and mostly for me. I'm happy. Great, great, yeah. It just sounds so sad when you said it's a constant chase. You just think, gosh, it's so sad because mm. we're all doing this, isn't it? Chasing, chasing. Mm. And we just never, ever catch mm. what we want. It's we just do, and then we have something a... else. We yeah, because we're addicted, it. aren't we, to the wanting. Yeah. This is the thing, you know, the sense of self mm. has to have something mm. to justify its existence. And it's actually challenging for the sense of self sometimes mm. to do less, right? Mm. To stop chasing, yes, to stop yeah. improving, I guess that's acquiring. The... That's, that's the underlying uh, motive behind all mm. this chasing. It actually makes us feel alive. Yeah. I, I it's, it's an adrenaline rush. It's an adrenaline rush and at a very subtle, subtle level, just a reason for existing. Which is exactly. We're trained. Yeah. yeah. You're trained in corporate America to keep improving, keep striving, keep moving, keep trying to achieve the next mm. level. And yeah. It's, it's yeah, a fallacy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fallacy. I like that. Mm. Yes, someone here is saying just this. I guess the sense of self, me, and mine, and I seem to play a big part in the wanting. Mm. Huge mm. part. Mm. I think Venchana touched on this earlier not seeing things as cause and effect. Mm. Yeah, like in terms of seeing things or at least seeing ourselves as conditioned processes helps undermine the sense of self certainly um but yeah it is the mm. i that wants i mean if there's no i then what can you want <laughs> you know i mean that's why this disappears at the level of anagami there's no more wanting there's no more mm. aversion because the sense of self is just so weak um yeah, this is why it starts to fade, right? After after stream winning, when the right view mm. is is there as a path factor, then the wanting starts to fade. Mm. You do you do it out of habit at first, but over time it just weakens because you know there's no one there to have the result of the wanting. And yeah, I mean these are the three types of craving, right? The craving for sensuality, karma tanha, which is what we're talking about here mostly. Karma K long A M A. And then Bhava Tanha, right? The craving to be, the craving to exist. If you if you knew that this is just arising and passing, it's just causality, conditioned processes like coming into being and disappearing constantly. I mean, there couldn't be a lot of Bhava Tanha, because it's futile, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And then the last okay. type of, um, yeah, if you put, you just put your hand yeah. up because this, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last type is um, the vibhava tanha, right? Not wanting to exist. And this is also a kind of craving. So it's really mm -hmm. tricky because, mm -hmm. you know, the sense of self will um, find a way it. to wriggle. Mm. somehow you know okay I, I want okay no I don't want because if I want then I'll be but no I don't want and it's mm. <laughs> it's still the I doing something mm. it's so tiring always looking for something I know mm. we'll read that one and then come okay. to Casey too bad that the world seems to equate our value as people to how many sense pleasures we can gather for ourselves <laughs> If you have a host of pleasures, oh, you're yeah. a winner. If you're sitting quietly under a tree with nothing, you're a loser. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm's favorite yeah, thing yeah. can be the biggest loser. Go ahead and biggest, <laughs> be the biggest loser. Yeah. Lose everything. First you have to lose your hair. That's hard enough for most people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes completely against what society, the Dhamma goes completely against what society teaches us about yeah. being the winner always, you know, the one who uh, gets more and more and more, but mm -hmm. we are going completely against everything that we have been taught. Well, to, well, for me, it feels that way. Everything I've been taught is not the way the Dhamma goes. It's not the route to happiness. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it, that if you have... You're completely right. It's like if you have a load of pleasures, that's success. That's how it's mm -hmm. measured. Yeah. Any right. Casey? Yeah, so I was just going to try to answer my the question that I posed after yes, the last yes, sutta yes, with yes, this yes. <laughs> assistance and then just um, hear your, your thoughts on it. So I think the, the interpersonal conflict is a little easier to trace. So we can think of something like brothers and sisters fighting over feeling like one child is a favorite child, right? Mm. And so maybe those are words that are, you know, mm. sounds that are mm. um, pleasant to the ears that mm. one child is being play praised and then the, the children want it and then there's mm. the seeking and you can see how that, the judging of, mm. oh, this, these, these words are positive and this child is getting them and why is my brother getting them and I'm not? And so you can kind of see how that leads to, yeah, and then safeguarding like the, the one, the child who feels like the favorite wants to kind of guard their place and the other doesn't. So I think that's, um, yeah, for, for me that, that makes a lot of sense. And then I'm trying to think on the, uh, then on the, the broader scale, um, so for me, I just, to, to contextualize it, the, in terms of the wars, the war I'm probably most familiar with is the Lao Civil War. So I'll use that as an example, even though maybe that's not the most familiar to everyone. Um, but uh, it was just to give a context, I think a lot of people have this this idea. During that time, there was the um, the Patet Lao, which was a um, communist uh, group that was trying to revitalize the country. And then there was the, the royalists, uh, so, uh, yeah, that we're trying to take it back both after the French colonial presence left. Mm -hmm. And so both sides are kind of trying to create their ideal country, to create a reformed version of their country. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, I mean, there, there are some places where you can make those sense pleasures clear, like um, if a royalist person saw like a, a king, the, the king of Laos, like with all of the the like royal oh garb and the royal temple like that is a something that's cognizable with the eyes that is pleasant and then you crave that and so we need to reestablish the monarchy so that we can see that and hear sounds yeah. that are pleasant like people cheering for the monarch and same thing with the <laughs> the communists like oh the we can finally gain um you know a communal uh, input into the government and we can change all of these, yeah, the, the capitalist ideas that are um, pitting one person against another in order to, mm. to help each other and have a whatever. So every, each side is has some of the sides that are sensual, but in some ways it reminds me of the fact that our, um, of our, like a lot of it is, is conceptual, but in a way it's something like we almost, I wonder what you think about it. Like we almost see things like we can see the country as a royalist country or as a communist country. And there's something appealing that like it appears in the mind, but 
I don't know if it counts as a sense pleasure to just feel like mm. there is something pleasant in thinking I have made this country mm. a royalist country, or I have made this country a communist country, and this is better mm. for that. So I wonder how that links to sensual pleasures, because that, that mm. definitely the word judgment reminded me mm. a lot of this kind of thing, that there are different people judging that one thing is good and one thing is bad, mm. that royalist is good and communist is, mm. is bad, or the other way around, or, yeah, the, mm. I, and I think, I just wonder mm. how how that fits into it. Like, how, mm. how does that boil these kinds of ideas? How, how does mm. that link through the sense pleasures? That's just the last gap that I'm mm. having trouble filling in my mind. Mm. I guess that's the Sankara stage. Mm -hmm. There's the form and then the, uh, the feeling, the perception. And then the Sankara is what uh, decides, ah, this is, this is a good one to, to act on. I will, mm. I will vote for my party and, and um, uh, make it happen, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So that's, I guess, that links that initial sight to, to, a, to, a, yeah. to, a, to a sort of feeling and a perception and an emotion uh, and a reaction that says, this is it. So would so, the sight be just like the words on the page of a communist book maybe or yeah. seeing a group of people who are right, like right. pro right. your party yeah, or yeah, like yeah, what yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. this is just the last link but the yes. link between that sankara <laughs> yes. and the 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 contact like where right. is the contact happening that forms this mm. yeah that's the, good, just the last good, thing I'm... yeah good 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 question good question could it not be um i don't think it's necessarily so much about the obvious contact at the sense doors, I think it might be more about attachment of view, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Maybe that's where the mm -hmm. judgment comes in, right? That you're forming a view about something. Mm -hmm. And when that view becomes very strong, then we get um, a certain hit. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I think, related again mm -hmm. to the sense of self. Like I think this way, I view it this way. And that gives you a sense of pleasure in the sense that you are right and you are... Mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever view you have mm. of yourself, it's obviously mm. a positive one because you think you've got the right view, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> you never think you've got the wrong view. Mm. And then there's a certain pleasure that comes from that, like mm. a certain sense of security or mm. get, or kind of a certain sense that... Um, it's like a sense that you can control the world because you know what's best for it and you can follow that. Um, but I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing when it comes to moral decisions. I mean, I think that's, that's slightly different there. Because here it's talking about more like judgment leading to desire and lust. So I'm not really sure it's talking about that here necessarily. But um, it's interesting that you did mention that there can be like a kind of attachment to looking at the mm. so-called beauty of royalty. Because I did notice mm. when the... I didn't watch it at all. Because um, my family are quite anti-royalist. <laughs> but I noticed that people really got into like them all parading around with their regalia on. And I just thought, kind of yuck. But maybe some people really mm. like that and think that's kind of looks mm. good and looks mm. like traditional and has all this history in it and mm. I don't know. Mm. And then there's it's desire and lust. It's mm. like you want to identify with it maybe. Because mm. the next mm. thing here is dependent on desire and lust is attachment, right? Dependence on attachment is possessiveness. So we get possessive about our royals or we get possessive about our views, you know, or get possessive about our politicians or whatever it is possessive about our Dhamma teachers can get possessive as well usually not through desire and loss but yeah views views, views I would yeah. say views. in this case yeah, yeah. can I ask That's a follow-up question I'm sorry to um, ask too many questions just yeah one last thing just Surely. because I'm having a little trouble again yeah. because in the last sutta mm. it's talking about how all, all of these wars and conflicts come from sensual pleasures so is views like a separate does views fall into that, or is views something separate mm. from sensual pleasures mm. as a cause of conflict? I think though, you, it's very hard to say this is this, this is mm. this. It's probably a combination of all these uh, uh, ways that the mind works. Mm. So you, it's, it's like a grayscale mm. of views and desires and non-views non and, uh, yeah, different aspects. You, I, I, I see it, different right. aspects. That yeah. Yes, Shirley. I've just been pondering whether comfort, security,
being in your sort of comfort zone mm. is a sense of pleasure. Mm, right. 100%. Now, this is where the attachment to royalty or mm. communism mm -hmm. will start mm, off from. Mm. So the conservatives, mm. the monarchists, they want things, you know, that makes them feel safe, it makes them mm. feel good. Mm. Yes, we've got a king, <clears throat> we've got, you know, these all have we have all mm. these lovely rituals, yeah. you know, the rich man, sorry to quote another Christian hymn, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, mm. you know, this is how the world should be. Mm. Um, and then you've got the mm. communist or the socialist or the reformer who is probably, I mean, here I'm, my own views are coming out, I'm afraid, mm. but they're wanting sort of security, maybe mm. feeling mm. everybody has a right to a sort of mm. basic income, education, mm. um, security, right. food. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to overthrow the system and make sure we have a more equitable mm. system. And then all this gets fossilised into views and then people mm. fight. And I'm just wondering where this That's is where true. the views no, come yeah, from, yeah. because we like to be in our comfort, comfort mm. zone. Yeah. And we yeah. all actually, yeah. we all actually crave mm. security, but mm. that can actually make us start, instead it's of really saying, well, yes, everybody wants to be happy, may all beings be happy, we start othering. Right. And we all yeah. do this. Yeah. I yeah. don't know whether Good that's point. where views really come from, where point. it fits in. Because yeah. I've always thought, yeah. yeah, it's the mind that's the yeah. body, you know, yeah. the senses yeah. are actually okay, they're just as they are. And now I'm sort of contemplating, yeah, it's what the mind does with this stuff input. Yeah. Yeah. And it's this really mm. basic need, because I, I don't feel like, you know, right. you know, I'm quite contented. Mm. But by goodness, mm. I like my safety, I like my yes, security, yes. I like my comfort. Yes, and yes, by goodness, yes. I want to see yes, I want to save yes, God yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. Um so I'm yeah. just wondering whether That's that true. is a good comfort point. is good actually point. Good point. A sense yeah, security. Of carrying yeah. out your comfort. Yes, yes. And things not to change. And things yeah. not to change or you yeah. things not to, change. to leave your comfort zone because it's to unpleasant. Leave your comfort zone. Yeah. yeah. I most people, it. most people. I think this yeah. is it. I think yeah. this is, yeah. It's very true. It's very yeah. true. The, the it's definitely yeah. essential pleasure, yeah. as far yeah. as I can see. Because yeah. it's like wanting to feel good. Yeah. Mm. I mean, in my project, I can forget about that. You know, I've had to go completely out of any type of comfort zone. Mm. And, you know, um, <laughs> and face all kinds of really challenging feelings. And, mm. you know, not feeling safe or secure in any way. I mean, now it's changing. But, um, mm. but... It's kind of, if you don't, if you're not able to be at ease with pain and discomfort, mm. you actually can't mm. kind of do, you can't do something that's purely values based in a way. Because you're always trying to feel good, mm. whatever you do. It's like, I'll do a little bit, I'll sacrifice a little bit, but only if I'm still, if I feel good and I feel pleasant and it suits me kind of thing. Mm. <laughs> So sometimes it's good to have a teacher who asks you to do something you have no choice in a sense, right? Because it pushes mm. you to do something that you don't necessarily feel is good. But then later you realise, mm. oh, actually, more valuable than feeling good and having this like sense of comfort, which is so delusive, right? Because mm. I mean, you're gonna die. You're gonna face deathly suffering, like it says here. You know, deadly suffering. Um, mm. Instead of that, you actually uh, start to have a life that's completely values aligned and that's where you get your happiness because there ain't no sensual pleasure when you're sort of working like a dog. <laughs> it's not a sensual pleasure, but then because obviously it's a spiritual pursuit, right? it's service, it's dhamma service. There's a lot of um, non-sensual pleasure like inspiration. I mean, I do think it's slightly different because the, the source is different, right? It's not that it's coming through attachment to any any body or any kind of particular experience. It's more like uh, the sense of, oh, you're helping others or, you know, the sense of gratitude, those kind of qualities. I think they're the ones we can start with because they give you a different kind of enjoyment. So they can take you out of that um, yeah. attachment to the comfort. Yeah. But I think that's a brilliant insight, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually. And I think that might be where it is. Mm. I just want to, I don't know, because there's not a lot of time and I just want to see if anyone else wants to say anything because i'm aware we've talked i about. have something 
a bit different, not on that. Yeah. I, I realize that I can't raise my own hand because I'm <laughs> <laughs> the disadvantage. Yeah. And I was I was kind of looking at these nine things rooted in cravings and seeing like, you know, where 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 do you identify that, you know, when can you put the brakes that, you know, something's happening? Because you can you can see somebody else, you know getting into the craving but you really can't observe yourself mm. and then from first mm. to the sixth like the momentum goes up and you get gains each step yeah and after the sixth one you are stuck there you're trying to get more and more but you're suffering isn't yeah. it so mm. it's like you know you're, you're you get into that and you can't get out of it but yeah. um where do we where do we identify that? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is going too much, and I need yeah. to do this sensory restraint or something yeah, yeah, somewhere yeah. at the beginning. I think so. I think it's somewhere at the beginning, actually, because it's almost like you say, you know, you're going down this uh, route, and it's like the train's gathering speed, and suddenly it starts to crash. And it's only maybe when the possessiveness and then the miserliness, depending on attachment, come up that uh, you realize it's suffering right but even mm -hmm. then many people don't realize it's suffering the thing is it's suffering all the way through <laughs> at the end here it's mm -hmm. only when you get the rods and weapons that you know it's suffering and maybe this is the problem you need the rods and weapons to wake you up i mean you don't need them you wouldn't wish them but it's only then and even then people think it's still going to be good if they win the war right <laughs> they still don't see that it's suffering so i actually think the buddha here in this certainly in the last one was actually bringing us right back to the point of the sensual pleasure itself mm. before even attachment comes up. You know, the cause is simply the sensual pleasure. Mm. So it's an interesting one because obviously we live in the sense world, right? And we are going to have some sensual pleasure. But maybe it's just to see the danger, like the Buddha always talked about seeing the danger, the gratification and the escape. So it's a part of life, but I think if we can see it as, okay, there is a gratification, there is a, a gain, but actually have this reflection all along that there's going to be a danger here. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why the Buddha's listing out the whole course, the sequence of events that can happen. Mm -hmm. It's like this does lead to, to deathly mm -hmm. suffering and to, and to even murder, right? And then the deathly, com the terrible karma that comes as a result mm -hmm. for many lives. Mm -hmm. And so in the sense, he's pointing out the danger here really quite mm -hmm. um, graphically. graphically mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to show us what can happen. So mm. I don't know, I think since we do live in the sensual world, first of all, we have the ethical precepts to kind of try and restrain us from breaking, you know, going too far, right? And they become more and more refined as one's practice develops, either naturally or through taking more precepts and more trainings. Mm. But also um, to have that wisdom factor that knows the danger and also that knows the escape. Because you can't just see the danger and be stuffed with it, right? You've got to have an alternative, like the mind will seek pleasure somewhere. So it has to have an escape, and that escape is through the jhanas. It's through the deep meditations, which bring up a kind of pleasure that is so much purer, right? I mean, completely incomparable to this. And I guess that's why Ajahn Brahm says, don't worry about like even desiring those things. I mean, sure, you don't kind of go for them with willpower, but you're already turning your desires in a different direction. Um, and they're not the kind of desires the Buddha kind of wanders against in the um, Dhamma Chakra Sutta. There it was like the craving to be, the craving to essential pleasures, the craving not to be, right? But he said there is the middle path. And then he talks about that in the um, Aranavibhanga Sutta. He says, you know, the two extremes are not the path, but the correct kind of pleasure to pursue is actually the four jhanas and then he goes into a lot of detail about the pleasure of those jhanas mm. the pleasure of giving up nekama renunciation yeah nekama sukha upasama sukha the happiness of peace paviveka mm. sukha the happiness of seclusion completely different from conflict and then the happiness of sambodhi actual happiness that's similar to enlightenment happiness because it's free from craving mm. Precisely because it's free from craving. So there's a happiness that is free from craving that's going in the opposite direction. And I guess that's what he's getting at. You know, it's it's going after the wrong happiness. And maybe that's the first problem. Like, okay, so there's things rooted in craving. And then depending on craving, there's seeking. This is really the problem. We're seeking in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So in that Aranavibhanga Sutta, it actually says, you know, 
there's some happiness to be pursued and some not to be pursued. Mm. And those happinesses not to be pursued are the sensual ones. So yes, you might still experience happiness, but don't pursue it. I think that's also one place we can uh, mm. we can very much undermine this process. Yeah. I don't know, does that make sense? Mm -mm. I think you have to have an alternative. I don't mm. know, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, we are seekers of pleasure by nature, that's what human beings um, we, we have to have some kind of pleasure to feel happy, so the Buddha gives us an alternative mm. it would be terrible leading an unhappy life mm. although there is the unhappiness that the Buddha says leads to happiness, so we can't always measure our life that way, like I was saying before. Um, you know, there's the, there's the suffering that leads to, to happiness, as right, well as... Yes, yes. I, uh, I mean, that, that's what it I is. Know. You, 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 there is some, some happiness there. Eventually, but sometimes there can be like, especially in monastic life, like one of the sufferings that he talks about that's wholesome is like mm. even lamenting and crying and being despairing of not being enlightened. Mm. He said that's not actually a bad one, because at least you're pointing yourself in the right direction. We only have a few minutes, but I'd love to come to Madhu briefly because um, you haven't spoken today, so we'll squeeze you in. Yeah, thank you, Mirabel. Um, is it right to say that there are pleasures that arise from obviously craving and also pleasures that arise from letting things go? Exactly. Mm. Right. That's exactly mm. what I was getting at, yeah, to mm. sum that up. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Mm. And that's what the Amana Vibhanga Sutta is all about. Have a look at it. It's really beautiful. The first um, pleasure described in terms of the jhanas is nekamasukha. That literally means the pleasure of letting things go, right? Mm. So he's saying don't pursue sensual pleasures. He actually uses some strong words there too. He says they're um, full of vexation, grief, despair, <laughs> um, fever, he, said, he actually says they're like, should I say that word? But he says this, it's milha sukha, which literally means piss happiness. <laughs> but what it really means is it's like seriously inferior, right? He calls it the, the sort of domain of the village people, the non-Aryas, the non-noble ones. He says they're coarse, they're filthy. So he really goes into quite a lot of graphic description. And I don't see it as so much a, a moral judgment, although it is certainly discernment. Um, as pointing out that compared to the pleasures of the mind, that's how they feel, you know. Mm. Like we were saying before, music is at one point in your life very beautiful, and at another time it becomes irritating, depending on the pleasures it's replaced by. So yeah, absolutely. Mm. The type of happiness based on craving is actually not really happiness at all. It's the cause of suffering, the Buddha said, craving is the cause mm. of suffering. So, yeah. It's a tough one. Mm. So last little comment and then we'll wind up. You want to read that one? I like the view to be able to let go and seek an alternative happiness to pursue through the jhana practice. Gives inspiration and a reason to let go. Yeah. yeah. Nice way yeah. to end. Nice, yeah. nice way to end. Yeah. Mm. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Exactly. Because otherwise, mm. sometimes when we talk about the happiness of jhana, not in the context of this kind of graphic description, we can think, oh, isn't that just kind of indulging or, you know, blissing out because it's nice and it's just some mm. kind of delusionary state, which, you know, ultimately maybe that's true. But yeah, we have to wean ourselves, right? Mm. So we need an alternative route and mm. these happinesses are based on letting mm. go. So they don't have the danger of inherent in sensual pleasure yeah. so, and they can grow alongside your normal life I mean obviously it's not so easy <laughs> but um, mm. it's just you know, don't condemn one but just incline slightly in another direction at least as well and then yeah after a while you'll want your whole life to just conduce to that mm. yeah. if you start living quieter more simply more kindly, less busily, mm -hmm. happy with a smaller house. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah.
happy being kind even if it hurts. <laughs> yeah. Super, super duper. So, who's going to say if it's me? Way. Yeah, now it's my turn to start talking. <laughs> I'm glad you did ask one thing because it's true that as a host you might never get the chance. <laughs> Matthias never asks or say anything. Yeah, so Matthias. this is not asking, this is now talking, just talking. Um, as you know, today's truth discussion is offered on a donation basis. That's the way um, we do in the Viharas, in the Buddhist practices, it's in the spirit of generosity. Um, so if you are able to make any contribution, I'll put the donation link. Uh, it is gratefully received uh, for, for the monastics, physical needs and the day-to-day -day running of the Vihara and also uh, to plan uh, for the development of the first England's first monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. And also you know that uh, there's a lot of education and guidance, um, so many things that we benefit as a community uh, from, uh, from the Ankampa Bhikkhuni project. Um, so if you are capable, you can do a donation and um, so I know um, oh, when it was uh, do ordination. <laughs> ordination. I know you said do ordination, but you said ordination. Do yeah, ordination will take a bit of a long time and uh, testing, is it? <laughs> testing by venerables. Oh. And uh, but for the food, um, uh, venerables are going to be there only until end of June. Uh, but if you still want to do a food that. Uh, Dana, um, before the end of June, you can uh, email team at ankampaproject.org. You can, you can uh, arrange it remotely as well. And uh, if you want to get, um, get involved in volunteering, there are specific volunteering needs that the project has. So um, talk about it, ask and uh, get more details. Uh, let them know, um, you know, what you can offer. And um, uh, so then they will direct you properly. And uh, there is one event coming in where uh, the Metta Retreat by Venerable Upeka and Venerable Chanda called Wisdom of Forgiveness. And it is, uh, all the details are in the events of the Anukampa project. So if you want to get registered for that, that is there. And also the events have Ajahn Brahm's tour details and you might have got the latest newsletter with lots of links and information there. Thank you. Thank you, Manori, very much. I did uh, be cheekily pin you there. So I'll remove the pin again and I guess we're back on. It's lovely to see Diana. I can't believe it. That means you're back in Massachusetts. Yay! <laughs> I saw, uh, you know, you can see our friend Emily there. I saw her kind of beckoning someone in. I thought, who's this? Is it her daughter? And then I saw her, it's Diana. Yay! My good friend. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Manori. I also just wanted to say, because you mentioned that we're raising funds to develop a bikini monastery, and we do already have a little vihara, so we're already benefiting those who come here, which is wonderful, and they're benefiting us as well, more to say. Um, so it's already becoming a really beautiful little community, a changing one constantly, because people only stay a week or something. But still, every little community that develops is very sweet, and it gives us a sense of the potential of this. So. Actually, although we've met the first step, it seems that we do need to expand and we will need to expand. I'm already full in November, December, pretty much. Maybe December a bit less, but, but pretty full. Um, and this is how we're going to grow. So really, really wonderful. Yes, there's a... Oh, that's right. On Sunday, yes. we have a special Vesak celebratory gathering. I forgot about that. Okay. Sunday evening. So that means Diana and Emily can now come more easily because you're in uh, the same time zone and everything. And uh, yeah, mm. uh, not a clue what we're going to do. But anyway, it is what it says in the notes. So <laughs> we shall mm. show up for it. And then we also have a day retreat in Cambridge that's not full. And you can come to that if you're in the UK, probably. If you're not in the UK, it's a bit far to go. But um, 
Cambridge, the wisdom of forgiveness. Mm. And of course, mm. Ajahn Brahm's events are all currently being booked. Mm. So there's still a lot of space, but we're more than 50% full for a weekend retreat already, and this is in November. So it is going to be full. If you leave it till sort of September to book, it's probably going to be a wait list. Mm. So, um, yeah, hope to see you all there. And um, what else? I guess that's it. I'm also, yeah, if anyone is in Oxford, I don't think you are, but I'm teaching at um, the Quaker Centre in Oxford on Monday evening. I don't think you're in Oxford, so never mind. Thank you so much to all the wonderful co-hosts and to everybody for their really, really insightful comments and questions, including the people here, Shirley and Casey. Really, really stuff that we could have talked about for a whole hour, I think, each mm. of you, really, because mm. it was very rich. So um, we'll wave goodbye. Mm. It'd be nice if you can all come and wave as well, if you wish, so people can see who you are. Matthias. You'll probably recognise everybody. You know Matthias, he's on his screen over there anyway. <laughs> but you can come. Green will look nice against the... It's all about visuals. Green will look very nice. <laughs> <laughs>